Hey everyone, Mr. Walker here. This is going to be the first of three lessons on cellular respiration. So this picture here shows us overall, uh, really the reaction for cellular respiration. So what is taking place in your cells? What is taking place um, in your muscles? So you do need to take in some sort of a fuel source. So the glucose that it's shown here is not the only fuel source that you can use. There are other kinds of carbohydrates. There are fats, there are proteins that you can use as well for cellular respiration. But in all cases, in order to essentially burn this fuel, what you do need is oxygen as well. This is the function of oxygen that you take in through your respiratory system. So at the end, the products that we do have of cellular respiration are carbon dioxide that you exhale out, that is a waste. Uh, water is also produced, but the entire point of this is to take one form of energy, the chemical energy of the foodstuffs, and convert it into the energy form that your cells can actually use to perform all of their cellular processes, like your muscles contracting, is the universal energy source of adenosine triphosphate, or ATP. So that is really the point of cellular respiration is within your cells to make ATP. This picture here, it does show us overall the three different stages of cellular respiration. The three different stages are number one that I'll be talking about in this lesson is glycolysis. Number two, citric acid cycle as it has it here. It goes by other names and I usually just refer to it as the Krebs cycle. And number three, oxidative phosphorylation, which involves the electron transport chain and chemiosmosis. So the one that I'm going to focus on in this lesson does not use the mitochondria at all. Glycolysis is simply taking place in the watery portion of the cell, which is the cytosol. So for glycolysis, what is going to happen is the food stuffs, in this case glucose, we see is going to be broken down into something called pyruvate or pyruvic acid. If we do have the mitochondria and to continue on with the other stages, that pyruvate would go into the mitochondria. But again, for now, we're just going to kind of focus on what is going on inside of the cytosol and with glycolysis. So what we're going to have is reducing power made, one form of chemical energy, NADH, and the other form, which is adenosine triphosphate or the ATP. So this picture here um, is showing really everything that you need to know in Biology 20 for glycolysis. Again, this is taking place inside of the cytosol of the cell. This is what is referred to as an anaerobic process. And what anaerobic means is no oxygen is required. Oxygen is not required for extracting some of the energy out of glucose, making some ATP when we're using the process of glycolysis. So for glycolysis, really what the word means, uh, this is the splitting, the glyco is referring to, well, really the glucose here or a sugar. So we're more or less taking a six carbon compound, which is the glucose, and at the end of glycolysis, converting it into two, three carbon compounds. So if I just use these circles here, to represent six different carbons. This isn't really what it looks like in glucose, but I'm just gonna line them all up in a linear fashion. So all of these initially connected together in the glucose. By the end of glycolysis, which is really a 10 step process, overall what's gonna happen is it's going to be split in half. So what we get at the end is instead of one large six carbon compound, we end up with two shorter three carbon compounds. And these two shorter three carbon compounds are the pyruvate or the pyruvic acid. And again, these three are going to be joined together.
So the point behind this is that we're going to take the glucose, one form of chemical energy, and convert it into two other forms of chemical energy, one of which can be used by your cells right away, that is ATP. The other one, which is reducing power and can be used later on if the mitochondria is available, and then some more energy can be extracted out of that as well in order to make ATP. So along the way, between glucose and pyruvate, a couple of important things that you need to know about, you actually have to add ATP. You have to invest some energy in order to begin the breakdown of glucose. So this first part, think of it as the first half of glycolysis, is where we have an energy input. You have to add some energy, and yes, that is in the form of ATP. Later on, we're going to make some ATP, but it's going to be twice as much. So we're going to make two ATP here. We're going to make two AT here, two ATP here. So even though two ATP were used, four were produced. So in the end, we talk about the net gain, four minus two. We've just gained two ATP by breaking down the glucose into the pyruvate. The other form of chemical energy that we have made is the NADH, and we can see that NADH was made here, NADH was made here, so two NADH have been made as well. Like I mentioned, it truly is much more complicated than this, and just to give you a feel for how complicated it is, here is our original glucose. Again, if we follow this in a clockwise fashion, fashion, we can see that there are many, many, many steps ending up with the same pyruvate. But overall, we're using ATP, we're using ATP, that's two that are used. We're producing ATP here, we're producing ATP here, and we're producing ATP somewhere else as well. Oh, sorry, it's an eight, it's two ATP per pyruvate. So we just multiply those by two, and that gives us our four ATP that are produced. And our NADHs, it's gonna be one per each pyruvate that is produced. So that would give us a gain of our two NADH. But again, don't really worry well too much about this picture at all. It's just to give you a feel for how complex it is. This is truly what you do need to know here and really everything that we do see on this one slide here. So I'm also going to take this chance to talk about a couple of other reactions that also occur inside of the cytoplasm after glycolysis, if oxygen is not available and the cell still needs to continue to make ATP. So the one that we have at the top here, what it is showing are two, we'll just think of them as side branches of glycolysis, leading to the formation of either ethanol, which is the alcohol that you find in alcoholic beverages, or lactate, lactate, lactic acid, which is the acid that is formed by your exercising muscles. But let's begin at the bottom where we once again do have the process of glycolysis. So this is going to be the beginning for both of these fermentation reactions that are at the top. So as we saw, glucose is used, some ATP is going to be used, we produce some ATP, and we produce those pyruvate. This process is going to shut down unless we can regenerate NAD+. So along the route here between glucose and pyruvate, what we already saw is that NADH is also produced. Eventually what is going to happen in cells though is in the absence of oxygen in an anaerobic environment is they're going to run out of the NAD plus so they can no longer make any more of the NADH. If they can't make any of the NADH then that actually shuts down the entire process of glycolysis. If you can't make NADH and you shut down this process, what that means is the cell can also no longer make ATP. So what takes place with alcohol fermentation? This is going to take place in yeast, and it's a two-step process where the yeast are going to take the product of glycolysis, which is pyruvate, 
and it's going to convert it into the alcoholic beverage ethanol. What it also does along the way is it's going to generate carbon dioxide. So also if you're using yeast for baking, for baking bread, what is causing the bread to rise, uh, the bubbles, is carbon dioxide bubbles that are being given off by this fermentation process. The other reaction leading to the formation of lactate or lactic acid, this is the one here that happens in your muscles. So if you are exercising at very high intensity, you can't take enough oxygen in to completely oxidize the pyruvate. And what that means is use the Krebs cycle and oxidative phosphorylation. But at high intensity, your muscles can kind of buy some time and continue to make a little bit more ATP for a short period of time. And this will be a very short period of time. But in order to do that, your muscles need to regenerate that NAD+. So in both the case of the ethanol fermentation and the lactate fermentation, really the entire point from the perspective of the cells, whether it is in the yeast or whether it is in your muscles, the point is to continue glycolysis. And to continue glycolysis, you need to have a reservoir of the NAD+, and that's exactly what these two processes here are going to generate. They're going to break down the NADH that was just formed. They're going to reform the NAD+. That allows glycolysis to continue, and it allows, in the absence of oxygen, for the production of ATP.